If you have your Bibles, do turn with me to Matthew 27, I'm reading out of the New King James Version, Matthew chapter 27, uh, verses 15 to 31. Last Sunday we spoke and focused on the Last Supper as it's known, and uh, we saw that many things happened at that Last Supper, but we focused on how Jesus humbled himself and washed his disciples' feet. And uh, I just love the messages around about this time of the year, and not only this time of the year, but as we, Paul says in one place, I preach Christ and him crucified. So um, I'd like to focus this morning on the actual trial uh, of Jesus. So I'm going to be reading from verses 15 to 31. So this was after the supper, uh, after... Judas had betrayed him, and when they were praying in the garden, and uh, this was when the chief priests held a mock trial and uh, tried desperately to get witnesses. Uh, None of the witnesses prevailed, and some gave false testimony, and eventually they asked Jesus, are you the Son of God? And he said, yes, he is. And so they cried out, what more? Witnesses do we need? And they therefore, because they were not allowed to put that particular council, were not, was not allowed, they did not have the authority uh, to put people to death. They sent him on to the governor, uh, Pilate, Roman governor at the time of that particular territory. So let's pick up the account on verse 15. It says, now at the feast, that's the feast of the uh, uh, Passover, the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, when they had gathered together, uh, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. It's it's most noteworthy that even a Roman governor uh, was cognizant, was very aware of what was going on, that these Jewish priests and this multitude, uh, because they were jealous, because they felt threatened, uh, that their place would be, and they admit as much as well, would be taken away. They therefore chose to have Jesus handed over to be crucified. Verse 19 says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife, that is Pilate's wife, sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I've suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So Pilate not only knew, uh, he was an experienced uh, a judge in judging matters. He knew this man was innocent. Um, and even his wife came to warn him. Uh, so verse 20 says, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes or the crowd that they should ask for Barabbas to destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? You might want to just remember that verse because that's what I want to focus on this morning. Maybe you can underline it or highlight it there. What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? It's interesting that he asks the multitude. He wants to absolve himself of the responsibility. They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And verse 24 says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Verse 26 says, Then he released Barabbas to them, and when they had scourged or whipped Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Verse 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him 
And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Fathers, we come to your word and Lord, we pray not that it would be traditional, not that it would be informational, but Father, that it would be transformational in our lives this morning. Speak to us. Thank you that you know each one of us, Father, and you're able to meet us at the point of our need today. And so we just pray, Lord, that your word would quicken us, that it would encourage us, uh, that it would lift us up again. Uh, Lord, we pray for this now. Bless each year of this morning, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. I want to focus, and I've entitled the word this morning, What Then Shall I Do With Jesus Called Christ? That is a question of absolute destiny. Now, and even more importantly, Eternity. What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And in a moment or two, I want to have a look at some of the characters. There are many, but I've mentioned a few characters and groups of people this morning, what I want to touch on, to see what they did with Jesus, to see how they answered that question when confronted with Jesus. But first, let me give you a little tidbit of information. And uh, Easter. Uh, The word Easter comes, it's actually comes from a pagan festival. I do know that. Um, Maybe you don't know that, and I don't think we always think about it. Um, But it comes from the goddess of, the ancient Greek goddess of spring, whose name was Istra. Easter, but the ancient or the early church picked up on the festival and transformed the festival as meaning new life because they celebrated spring as the beginning of new life. And so the Christians began to celebrate it in the early church many, many centuries ago as the new life brought by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's where the word Easter. So uh, when you see all of the Easter eggs and everything around at this time, um, that's what it's for. Not many people know it. They just do it and celebrate it. Uh, But should we use that at this time? Well, it depends how you look at it. Um, I look at it as an opportunity. I want to give you a quick example and then go to what I want to speak about this morning. Paul, when he was in Athens, uh, he came to the city of Athens and he was taken aback how many gods with small g's and idols and altars to idols uh, were over there. Now remember, they hadn't heard the gospel at all. Uh, And he he didn't criticize them. He, He said... Uh, brethren, and once he had started speaking and got a group together, because they were always debating in the city at that time, the Greeks, and he said, I notice that you're very religious people. Huh. Actually gave them a compliment. Huh. He said, I've seen all your gods, and I've even noticed that there's an altar to the unknown God. And I just want to tell you today that I want to tell you about the unknown God, huh. about the God of heaven and about Jesus. And he used that as a bridge, if you like, to share the message of Christ. He even quoted one of their own poets. He said, even as one of your, and you can find it in Acts 27, he he said, even one of your own posts have said uh, that we are his offspring. We are the offspring of God. And then he said, well, you know, we cannot be offspring of gold and precious uh, stones and silver. And now we are far more valuable than that. We are actually God's offspring. 
And he used that to preach the gospel and about how Jesus died and rose again. And when he mentioned that Jesus rose again, there were three reactions. I'm talking about what, will we, what shall we do with Jesus at that time. There were some who ridiculed him, because in the natural, you know, the idea of rising again just doesn't gel. Uh, so they mocked him. There were others who said, uh, we would like to hear you again on this matter. And come again and invite you back. And others believed and became Christians. And we know that the early church was established in those areas uh, at the time. So just like them and just like the many people who surrounded and this was an absolute momentous event. Uh, so much so that we still celebrate and remember Jesus today. Not because he is some dead idol or God of Christianity, but because he indeed rose again. He's the living Christ. You see, once you've experienced the living Christ, uh, we get a whole new perspective of life. And indeed, we get eternal life. And that is why. And that's why you'll find at this time and at Christmas as well, there will be many programs. And, and who was Jesus? And try to sow doubt. And I always say, but why are they so worried about a Jew who lived 2,000 years ago? Why are they not worried about proving some of the other gods <laughs> their veracity? Uh, because Jesus is the only one who is alive. And that's why. So they try everything to do that. But um, I thought I'd give you that. So they had a choice to make. We had have a choice to make. Firstly, I want to, the Bible speaks at Jesus' time, and we get it now as well about the crowd, the multitude, depending on your version. Now, the crowd, the Bible tells us as much, this multitude who followed Jesus, we need to distinguish between the crowd and the disciples. So we've got disciples who are relatively few who were, grew in number, and then we've got the multitude. Uh, the multitude and the crowd can be easily swayed. When Jesus was healing, when Jesus was feeding, uh, the, he was very popular. Uh, they were the ones who threw the palms down and shouted Hosanna, and they wanted to make him king there and then. But when, and I've mentioned this before, I know that, uh, but let us be reminded, but when they were confronted with the idea of a suffering Christ, when Christ now had to be put to death, suddenly the crowd flipped. Just like a, tr a crowd can change very, very quickly. And the same crowd who sought Jesus, and Jesus at one time said to them, look, you're seeking me just because I gave you something to eat. So the crowd represents, and I'm asking the question, what shall I then do with Jesus? So they used Jesus as long as it was self-serving, as long as it was expedient. Uh, but when things began to change and turn, they quickly abandoned uh, Christ and were swayed by popular opinion of the, of the priests. Secondly, we see... The acclaimed religious, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the elders, the experts of the law, these all vehemently opposed Christ. And throughout his ministry, we would see this crowd of so-called religious people. And folks today don't think that everyone who looks like a religious person is a Christian. They can be dressed in, and that's how they were dressed, in all the nice flowing robes and have all sorts of collars. I'm not mocking that. I'm not saying they're not if they wear that. But don't go by outward. In fact, Jesus said uh, to them, uh, you know, you look good on the outside, but you're actually full of dead men's bones. And he actually said to them, you're of your father the devil, but yet these were the people who professed to represent the mainstream of religion. South Africa professes to be a very religious country, doesn't it? I mean, statistics tell us that something like over 90% of people profess that they are Christians. 
But I believe it. <laughs> you need to have a look at what they're doing with Jesus, the real Christ, and then we can tell. Jesus said, by the fruit you will know them. As we look carefully, we'll find all sorts of other things mixed with the Christianity. We'll find tremendous materialism, gods, idols. Yes, materialism, covetousness is gods, false gods. We sometimes find ancestral worship, uh, witchcraft, and all of these things mixed with Jesus, and we cannot do so. And we'll find that the disciples of today are many, but relatively few. So I don't believe for one moment <laughs> that when they say South Africa is over 90% Christian and I see the things going on, I have to say that most are of their father, the devil. So we have much work to do uh, in ministry to them as well. So they claimed religious and learned of the day, reacted uh, and rejected with jealousy and animosity uh, Jesus, as I've just said. In fact, it was the high priests who instigated, and as we just read, they were the main instigators. And the Bible says that they're those who teach men, not only who do wrong, but to teach men and lead them astray. There's a special place in hell for them. A special place for those who lead men astray. And we see these men, and I'm mentioning this for a reason this morning, instigating and swaying the crowd to cry, crucify him. Uh, they, they wanted to get the majority vote, if you like, uh, you know, to persuade Pilate. Thirdly, we see Herod. I haven't read the account again, but Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. And Herod was very glad because he wanted to see Jesus perform some sign or miracle. He had heard about Jesus. He thought that it's, he was John the Baptist risen from the dead. And that was on his conscience because he had, uh, because of the, his wife's daughter, uh, had John beheaded, John the Baptist. Uh, and he, and he, he earnestly sought an audience with Jesus, hoping that Jesus would perform some sign or miracle. I'm asking, what then shall I do with Jesus? You see, there are many today even who only look for Jesus for some sign or for some miracle. Uh, like the Pharisees as well. Show us a sign and we'll believe in you. And I always say that believers don't follow signs. The Bible says signs follow believers. The difference. So as we believe in the Lord, we're going to see signs. You'll see miracles in your life. The word will be quickened to you. God will answer your prayers, uh, not to mention how you will save you. You will know. But let us not run after signs. Fourthly, we see the soldiers, as I've just read, and others who, who mocked him. Many went confronted with Jesus today in the workplace or whatever. They'll mock you. <laughs> They'll might not physically spit in your face, but they will reject you. They will even ostracize you, and they will persecute you as well. Anyone who's truly godly, the Bible says, will be persecuted. So don't always think that everyone will receive your message, but others will receive your message and they will believe. But so, yeah, we have a group of, as representative of those who mock, those who ridicule. Ha <laughs> ha, you see in the light, you know, and... Uh, all of this sort of thing. Pilate, as I've just read, was one of those who bowed to the pressure of popular opinion. He knew very well that Jesus was innocent. We've read it a moment ago. He had this demonstration that how he's washing his hands and that's going to make him innocent. No, it's not. Because the Bible says that every man will give an account of himself before God. No one can say uh, I'm doing an action and then I'm absolving myself of responsibility. Every man will give an account, the Bible says, of what he has done, whether good or evil, and will be rewarded uh, as to whether he's done good or evil. And that much is clear. What about Judas? We spoke about Judas last week. Judas betrayed Jesus for the love of money. When he saw things wasn't going his way, when we saw that this had taken a bad turn, that indeed the kingdom was not being set up at this time. He chose to betray 
Jesus to the hands of his enemies. It was a deliberate decision. It was a planned decision. And we know what happened to Judas afterwards when he saw that he was surprised that Jesus was now convicted to death. And then he was remorseful and he ran and to go hang himself. In fact, if you've never seen the, uh, I'm just trying to think of that film now, The Passion of the Christ, um, it's a very, very good film and very accurately, interestingly enough, describes the events of that day and how Judas became like tormented and, and killed himself, the Bible says. The disciples, those are some not so good examples. What then shall I do with Jesus called Christ? Now the disciples were those when Jesus called them, they became his followers. They stuck by him, they served him, they grew in his word, they began to minister with him and were later sent out. So the disciples stood faithfully with Jesus till the end. In fact, Jesus said of them, you are those who have stood by me. Because even at one time when Jesus began to preach that, that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he said that, uh, you have no part in me. And many became offended and turned back from him at that time. Some of the crowd, some of those who had been following him. And yet he said, the words I speak to your spirit, the truth, that you've got to become partakers of me. So these were those, like many I trust today and many listeners are disciples. They pledged to die with him. But we know that they weren't ready in maturity at that time. And they actually fled uh, at that time. Just like Peter as well. He was supposed to die. All betray you, Lord. I'll never betray you. I'm willing to die for you. But later on, uh, history tells us, tradition tells us, that all of the disciples, the apostles, became martyrs. You see, at that time, they were ready. Uh, Peter was hung upside down. He chose to be hung upside down, crucified. That was a lot later, um, uh, because he felt unworthy to be crucified as Jesus was. Many died. They went into all parts of the world. Uh, Thomas into India, many of them to the Middle East, uh, some towards the Russia port, some towards Africa. They went all over ministering uh, the gospel. And we know some of the great early churches were formed at that time, multicultural churches. Uh, in fact, we sent out Paul and Barnabas a bit later, and we see that the gospel taking uh, shape. But yet they all died and became martyrs, except John. Uh, John, the beloved disciple, uh, tradition would say, and when I say tradition, I'm speaking about uh, very, very uh, credit, credible people like Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, although not a Christian, described on the outside a very accurate portrayal of the events of history at that time also, even though he wasn't directly uh, involved. And so John, they said, they put him in boiling oil and he was miraculously delivered uh, and when they took him out, he wasn't dead. They were very, very afraid, and they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And there he had the revelation, and thus we have the book of Revelation as well that we read uh, from the Lord. So the disciples, when they heard the message of Christ, they chose to be followers. The women, who were also disciples, the Bible mentioned the women, they weren't directly involved often in what we may con consider mainstream ministry, but they had a vital role to play. They, they supported Jesus and his disciples. They cooked for them. They, they served them that they could do the role that God had called them to, and they played a vital. In fact, they were even more faithful uh, than the disciples. They were around the cross. They weren't too far away uh, at the time, and they were the first ones who sought to honor Jesus uh, in his burial and saw where they had, had put him and so forth. And they were also the first. Mary Magdalene was the first one of the women and the other women to see Jesus rise again. And I described, I think, a few weeks ago, that's such a beautiful picture, that the one out of whom seven devils were cast, perhaps what we would consider the worst of sinners, 
probably being involved in all sorts of things. She was the one who saw Jesus rise again first and who loved the most in many respects. And so there was a woman who followed. Second last this morning, as we just consider some of the responses when asked the question, what shall I do with Jesus? There were two thieves, the Bible says. It was prophesied as well that he would be among criminals. Both were criminals. Both were condemned to death. One on the left, one on the right. And they cursed and they blasphemed. And then one came to his senses, the Bible said, and one repented. And he rebuked the other thief and he said, you know, we are here because we deserve to be on this cross. But this man is innocent. And then he said to Jesus, Father, or Jesus, please remember me when you come to your kingdom. And at that last time, he expressed faith in the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. What a precious story and account that was as well. Then finally, I want to mention is Joseph and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the man we hear about. He was also of the Pharisees. And Sadducees. So while the majority of the priests uh, uh, rejected, the Bible says there were many, in fact, who did believe, uh, but it also says that some of them chose rather to have the place uh, and, and not to give up their place because they knew to believe in Jesus would be to be kicked out of the, uh, uh, out of the religion, if you like, and their, their place. Uh, so they, choose the, they chose the favor of men rather than the favor of God. But yet there were those who believed, and Joseph uh, of Arimathea and Nicodemus were two such who also were of the council. And they were secret disciples. Uh, Nicodemus uh, came to Jesus at night because he didn't want anyone uh, to see him. Uh, and he began to uh, ask Jesus and, and say, no man, you know, no man can do the things you do unless they were of God. And, and Jesus began to explain to him, and say so that unless a man, unless you are born again, you cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus, all the while, was a secret disciple. Uh, I know from missionaries who work in places like Iran and these places which are very closed uh, and with this heavy persecution, there are many people who actually worship the Lord, um, but they do so secretly sometimes. And so we don't always know about these things. But later on, interestingly, these secret disciples who were initially afraid, uh, they became bold while the other disciples who proclaimed that they would never forsake Jesus or deny him, uh, they sort of ran away for the time being. And, but yet they came boldly and approached Pilate for the body. And uh, Pilate, once he had confirmed that Jesus was dead, gave them permission, and we know that Jesus was buried uh, in Joseph's own tomb, a tomb that had never been used. A big stone was rolled in front of the tomb. The Pharisees and the, the priests then became even more anxious. In fact, they believed more than the disciples at the time that somehow he would rise again. And they said to Pilate, uh, uh, look, can we just seal this, this tomb and make sure that no one steals the body? Uh, because, you know, then the last is going to be worse than the first, uh, because we know how that deceiver said he would rise again. And we'll hear maybe more about that on Sunday. Uh, and, but Pilate said, make it as secure as you can. They put a guard there that's 16 people changing shift, Roman guard, four at a time. Those in the military, and they sealed the stone. It was a stone that weighed tons, so you could not just move it. And that's why the woman asked, who is going to roll away the stone? for us, and so forth. But Joseph, so here we see certain uh, characters and people at that time in what they did with Jesus. But now the question is, as I conclude this morning, is what will you do with Jesus? You see, Pilate asked the question and he tried to palm it off. And sometimes we can want to do that, just absolve ourselves from responsibility, but we cannot do that. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. What then shall I do with Jesus? That is the eternal question that not only confronts us the first time we hear the gospel, 
And I believe most of you have heard the gospel here before, and most of you are believers. But if you've never heard the gospel, maybe on the podcast this morning, what are you going to do with Jesus? This is a message for those who've never put their faith in Christ. A message to come to Jesus. You see, we have a choice. We can either choose to be among the mockers. We can choose to crucify him. You can say, can I crucify him? Yes. If we reject Christ, his blood will come upon you, not to cover you, but for God to take vengeance against all those who rejected. And that's why they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. What then shall I do with Jesus? For those who have never believed, those who rejected Christ would do absolutely everything to change history. I've read first this morning about those who rejected, those who mocked, those who spat, uh, those who remained indifferent, those who chose the favor of this world rather than following Jesus. I can tell you they would give every, anything. They would give everything because already as we speak, they've been for in hell for 2,000 years in torment. Because they rejected and there's no possibility of escape ever. It's a solemn question. And Christian, we need to confront those with Jesus. Yes, you're going to get mocked. Yes, you're going to get ostracized. Yes, you're going to get unfairly treated. Yes, you may not get that promotion. But give the message in any case. There are those who will believe. There are those who will say, I want to know more about Jesus. There are those who will believe. And so let us be mindful of that. How do I know that those who would in hell would do absolutely anything to have their unsaved loved ones who would be the greatest evangelists on this earth if they came forth? You see, Jesus gave a picture, and I'm concluding, of that. He gave a picture of a rich man in hell, in torment. He gave a picture of Abraham standing in a distance with a big chasm in paradise. With Lazarus, that, that beggar at his gate, <laughs> with the dogs licked his sores and did not have any bread was now comforted with Abraham and he was in torment in hell. And he said, can someone not just give me a drink of water? You know, I'm, in, I'm in flame, I'm in torment. And, and Abraham said, no one can come from there to you even if they want to. You see, the wicked will one day see the righteous afar off and there will be eternal regret, eternal remorse, but a situation that will never be able to be changed again. How tragic it is that these people who rejected Christ for a fleeting moment of pleasure and position, instead of receiving him and being in paradise. The rich man in hell then said, but please then can you send someone Send someone from the, the grave to go minister to my brothers and sisters, my family, that they do not come to this awful, terrible place. And Abraham said, they have the war, word, they have the law, they have the prophets. And he said a profound thing, if they do not believe him, they will not believe someone even though he rose, comes from the dead. You see, that's a heart. We believe with the heart. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, or we reject him. What then shall I do with Jesus? We need not be left in any doubt this morning. In fact, the Bible gives us a very clear answer, and I want you to take, encourage you and take you to take this away. You see, Jesus has died many, many years ago. Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father making intercession with us. He is present through the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our midst. 
is everywhere, but that's his manifestation the Bible speaks about. Um, what then shall I do with Jesus? Turn with me, and I want to conclude with this and encourage us as Christians this morning. Matthew 20, 25, verses 31. Yeah, we have two groups of people. We have a portrayal of the final judgment. This is when Jesus comes in his glory. We have goats on the left representing people and sheep on the right. And Jesus addresses both groups, those who rejected Christ and those who received Christ. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, that is Jesus, say to them on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let me just stop there quickly. The kingdom is prepared for believers and the brethren, those who follow Jesus from the foundation of the world, before, long before Christ was even crucified. God had already prepared a place where he wants all men to be, but where only the sheep, those who believe, will go to. And that's very, very important to understand. You see, God is not willing that any should perish is long-suffering. We might say, but why doesn't Jesus come sooner? Well, the Bible says in Peter that the, the Lord is long-suffering. He's, he's patient. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to salvation. And so God is working for that. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's speaking to the sheep now. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. Yes, Christians do get sick sometimes. I was in prison and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer, saying to him, Lord, when saw we you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When saw we you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? Now listen. 40 says, And the king shall answer and say to them, Truly or verily I say unto you, Since you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, my family, my brothers and my sisters, you have done it unto me. So friends, family of God, if we want to answer that question this morning, emphatically, truthfully, verily, What am I doing with Jesus is whatever I'm doing to the body of Christ. The Lord says it. And that is the criteria in this particular portrayal of whether they are sheep or goats, whether they are those who received Christ, as the Lord has addressed this first group, or those who have rejected Christ. He then addresses the, the goats of those who did not believe. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in naked, and you clothed me not sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then they shall also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked? or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you. Then again he says, then he shall answer them, Verily, or truly I say unto you, since you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. Christian, are we passionate about Jesus? 
and we need to be passionate about his family. And this needs to be just an encouragement that God has prepared a kingdom, an eternal kingdom for us. Not just something that he says to this crowd, go to a place prepared for the devil and his angels. I actually never prepared this place for you, but based on the criteria of what you've done with Jesus <laughs> and chose instead to, to follow the ways of the world because you're either for me or against me, you've rejected me and therefore you're going to end up with the devil, your father. It says, and these shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal or everlasting life. Jesus is very clear over there and gives us that wonderful answer. What then shall I do with Jesus? The good news is we have opportunity, firstly, to take this message, invite them, tell them that God is a place prepared for them, that Jesus loves them, but also warn them that should they reject, should they mock, uh, should they remain indifferent, should they just remain preferring to do their own thing, that there is a place called hell that awaits. But on the other hand, should they receive, should they follow, should they minister to the body of Christ in their various giftings, whatever that is, they are going to be wonderfully blessed for all eternity. This short time on earth, folks, let us make the most of every opportunity to serve the Lord, to serve one another, because that is the criteria that we see over there, just like we did at that time. What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? It's not too late to change. Whatever your situation is, we have opportunity. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, again as we survey this wondrous cross on which the King of Glory died. We can but stand in awe. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity. And Father, I bless each disciple, whether they've been following you for a short time or a long time. Thank you that they are following you. Bless them, Lord. May they be encouraged, Lord, to continue today. I pray for each one here, for those listening who love you. May they be encouraged. May they even be spurred. May we be spurred on to not think that what we do is menial, like we heard last week. And what we do to the body of Christ doesn't count. Lord, because your word says what you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Father, help us as your people to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Help us afresh, Lord, as we walk out of this place today to be challenged to prioritize your kingdom and your righteousness and we know that you will add all of the other things, all of our needs. You love us, Lord. You clothe the, the grass of the field. Lord, you feed every living thing. Lord, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like that. And thank you that you love us, you care for us, that you're not only the author, but you're the finisher of our faith. I bless your people today. And thank you, Lord that you continue to wash us, you continue uh, to enable us to stand with robes of righteousness. If you've never made a personal decision, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're listening on the podcast, I want to invite you to respond to that question this morning by receiving Jesus, by making a personal decision and saying, Lord, I want to honor you. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for me, that such was the severity of sin and the consequence of sin that you had to pay that price. May I not count your blood as a common thing, but may I cherish the cross and I receive you as my personal saviour. Forgive my sins. 
Lord, I receive you. I believe that you've died for my sins. I want to follow you. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. And I want to invite anyone, whether you're here, whether you're listening on the podcast this morning, to do so. If you've never made a personal decision to believe with your heart, and I want to encourage you to do that and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says you will be saved. You will be saved. Father, we thank you now for your goodness and thank you that we could just choose a few moments this morning, uh, Lord, to honor you, to remember you, just to reflect once more and afresh and be ignited, encouraged in our faith, Lord, to answer that question and to answer it in such a way that honors you, to bless those who love you, others, Lord, whether they be weak in the faith, whether they be strong in the faith, we thank you for this now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for uh, earlier on I was thinking to myself, should, maybe we should have had it at nine o'clock, and, <laughs> but thank you for making it uh, this morning. And uh, we, we're not going to take an offering this morning, so if you do want to bring something, you can do that on Sunday. Uh, but if you need any more ministry this morning, if you need prayer, uh, we are here. If you haven't made somehow made a decision, a personal decision to receive Jesus as your Savior, don't walk out of this place without doing that. I just want to really encourage you uh, in that this morning. We are here for you. Um, now, Sunday's at 9 o'clock. Uh, and as I said last week, don't leave Jesus on the cross. Okay, he did rise again. So we want to hear the other part, and that is the good news as well. He did not stay on the cross. He's no longer on the cross. I don't like people who wear a cross with Jesus on the cross, because uh, he's not on the cross anymore. <laughs> okay, and uh, maybe if people knew that that cross is, a, is an execution method, they would think a little bit about it. <laughs> But I know it means many things and people cherish it as well because of the work that has been done. We are also having a baptism service and uh, on Sunday after we'll have the message. Pastor Nube is going to bring the message but after that I'll be doing the baptism. And so immediately after that we're going to go out and I think of no better way actually of celebrating the resurrection of Christ than by having a baptism service uh, because that's what water baptism is all about. I'm dying to my old self, I'm identifying with Christ, and I'm raised in newness of life with the Lord Jesus. That's what water baptism is. If you've never been baptized, if you've believed, and uh, you still have time, uh, we have a lot of time, you can just see Justin, my lovely wife over here, and you can just give your name and she'll tell you, it's no big thing to do. All you've got to do is believe and put your faith in Jesus, and that's very important, so we do have a number of those who are being baptized, and we're very blessed. But if you want to join the ranks, now's the time to do it. Don't delay it. Uh, baptism actually identifies you as being a member of Christ. I'm now part of the body of Christ. I'm demonstrating, I'm showing others, I'm testifying that I've died with Christ and I've now risen in new life with him. So do speak to Jocelyn, and I just want to remind you of that. And at this point, I'm going to invite the worship team up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And uh, Jenny, would you come and help? Um, over here. Uh, Chantel, could you come help us as well, if you don't mind? We've got Delian up there. She's helping. We can't split her into two. <laughs> but praise the Lord. Uh, very, very warm and special welcome. It's so good to see uh, all of you today. Uh, on our Good Friday service uh, this morning and then we have got the resurrection service on Sunday at 9 o'clock so we're looking forward to that but we'll tell you more about that a little later uh, today. Uh, this morning as we come to the table um, let us be reminded of what the emblems that is the bread and the cup represent today. And I think especially at this season, uh, which is known in many parts of the world as Passover and also as Easter, uh, and we'll mention it a little later this morning, but the bread represents the broken 
body of the Lord Jesus. And as Jesus did after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken uh, for you. And so as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup as well. And he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do remember me and you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And may I make mention of this at this point, when the Lord says and when the word says his body was broken for us, it really was broken. Um, If we read in the scriptures, and we'll come to that in a moment or two, um, they whipped him with 39 lashes. Uh, They weren't allowed to do 40, but they would do 39. They would tie you to a post and... On those lashes, there were leather thongs and with bits of bone and and metal and things like that on. And they'd literally whip you that your body actually opens. And it says in the scriptures that your bones are exposed. So uh, besides the cross, before he even went to the cross, he was crowned, we know, with the crown of thorns. The soldiers mocked him. Uh, The crowd shouted, crucify him, crucify him. His body was really broken. He was nailed to the cross through his hands and through his feet. And uh, the Roman cross was designed to bring a slow and most agonizing death. Uh, But yet Jesus foresaw that. He didn't go by compulsion. He went willingly to die for your sins and for my sins and that's why we stand today and just remember him at this very very special time there's much we could say they pulled out his beard Uh, the person on the cross would eventually die through asphyxiation they would put a nail through both feet and hanging on the hands and to breathe you'd actually have to push up uh, to breathe but eventually the person became so tired that you couldn't breathe anymore and death would come sometimes after a day two or three. So it was a very, very agonizing time. And I point this out not to make us uh, feel uncomfortable this morning, but to be reminded of of the great price that was paid. And there was a reason this price was paid, because Jesus, who for the joy set before him, you see, he saw many sons. And as Jocelyn read a little earlier as well, uh, he saw many sons coming to glory And that's why he did it. He did it for you and for me uh, this morning. Um, If you are a Christian, if you made a decision for Christ, you believe in Jesus and you're following him, then I want to invite you to participate uh, with us this morning. Uh, We had a question the other day, uh, should children partake? Well, children, the Bible says, of such is the kingdom of God. And so you may give to them as well, and uh, we're not too involved in tradition, but as long as you understand what it's about this morning, and that's important. So I'm going to give to uh, Janine and Chantal, and they're going to serve you. Just hold on to your little cup. We are still using these cups where you, I think because of convenience, so you just peel the top off, and there's a little wafer, wafer of unleavened bread, because that's what they had at the Passover, but uh, we're not too mindful of that, and then there's a cup underneath. So I want you all have, and then we're going to partake uh, together. partake of the cup together today. Praise the Lord. I trust that everyone has had, uh, that we've missed no one out this morning. 
You see, little one wants to help mom open it there. And <laughs> close it up. Thank you. Thank you to those who helped and to those who prepared the table as well. Thank you to the uh, ladies.